Thank you. Uh, so thank you again for the invitation to also present um, my work here. So yesterday I had no images, and today I have too many. So let's see. Um, so as we were talking about curating and exhibitions, biennials, and the role of architecture, I want to talk a little bit how I ended up in this business of doing exhibitions. And um, yeah, so I want to tell you a little bit of that. And then also my different positions in certain exhibitions, what I was trying to do, what uh, went right, what failed completely, and so on. So let's see. I see. Okay. Yes, yes I, 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 do, I do it like this. So I, I, was, I was trained as an architect and I was working in architectural offices, also doing my PhD in Madrid, and I got a grant, a Fulbright grant to study in the US. And in that same summer that I was supposed to go to the States, it was a series of uh, citizens' movements happening all over the world. And obviously you remember the anti-government demonstrations in Tahrir Square that then uh, gave rise to what was called the Arab Spring. Um, but also, I was still in Madrid when it happened the, all the indignados movements, as well calling for more democratic approaches and more citizen participation in the institutions of power. And in the summer when I arrived to New York, um, it was Occupy Wall Street. So it was this uh, increasing uh, pressure by citizens all over the world uh, to claim for a more democratic uh, approach, to so have their voices heard. And obviously that was connected to the uh, economic crisis, but not only. So they were uh, approaching and referring to many types of institutions, institutions of power, but also of education, cultural institutions, and so on. So as a result, and I'm looking into cultural institutions primarily, um, many of these institutions, for instance, museums, felt the pressure to respond to these claims. And their programs started to be more aware of the necessity to do programming and activities, not only inside the walls of the museum, but rather outside in the street. Something that Leah has been also talking about in, in, in her talk, how from uh, these practices of architecture and exhibitions goes from the gallery to the outside world. And in particular, I started as a student there in, in New York to be interested in two um, uh, projects that then uh, became part of my, uh, my research as a PhD uh, that I finalized in, in Madrid. One of them is the Saint Pompidou Mobile, uh, but Patrick Bouchon was the designer. And it was this attempt by the Pompidou to uh, create a museum was traveling and was bringing what they call like the, the artworks that belong to everyone in the country to the larger population in France. Not only the ones who can access the Pompidou in Paris, but actually to other many populations who actually haven't even gone to a museum. And at the same year, there was also this other big institution, in this case, the Guggenheim, who launched another initiative that was called the BMW Guggenheim Lab, that was a traveling toolbox, also a traveling institution that was supposed to go to different cities in three different cycles, bringing ideas of architecture and the city and a form of collaborative participatory practices in an architecture that was not only mobile, but was transformative, didn't even have walls, and was able to occupy different spaces in the street. So you can see this attempt, like I'm not talking about any minor museum, but two major museums that were very well known because of their buildings, and that in any other case wouldn't have been uh, interested in occupying places that wouldn't be primary locations in cities. Suddenly they were interested in traveling and going to you know, much more uh, humble uh, spaces of the city and actually other, other countries and other cities. This is, for instance, the interior of the Guggenheim Lab. As you can see, there is no white wall. There is no objects of display. It's a site primarily for discussion. And a few blocks away was actually the demonstrations of Occupy Wall Street. Obviously, 
for me, that was signing a changing paradigm of how institutions were connecting to the city and to citizens. And was a change of paradigm if we compare to the former paradigm that was the so-called Bilbao effect, was this idea that through architecture, big iconic buildings signed by important architects, cities will transform. But the capacity of these architectures to attract funding, to attract investment, to attract visitors, uh, uh, tourism and so on, there was the possibility that just with one building, an entire city or region will change. Obviously, uh, it's much more beautiful in paper than in reality. It's not that easy a story. But that was the paradigm that we were under. And many of these institutions, including the Guggenheim, wanted to replicate that model once again and again and again. But obviously, with the financial crisis, all these uh, plans drop. And suddenly, this idea of a more temporary institution that was able to travel and was much more light and cheap <laughs> uh, get more attention. Under this claim of more democratic approach, obviously, there were other claims. And this I connect with the rise of biennials. These attempts of suddenly, instead of thinking about transformation of cities through big architecture uh, master plans, rather with these temporary uh, events. And if you think about it, I was talking about uh, how after the crisis, no, the uh, years 2007, 8, these two institutions happened in 2011, and you see the peak of the number of biennials and triennials happening is also in these years uh, what happened. So in a way, there is a correlation, at, at least that's the argument that I, I also defend in my, P, in my PhD, around these questions. And more and more, this uh, relation between participatory, even activist practices and institutions and biennials gets more complicated and even blurred. For instance, this in 2012, uh, where Occupy activists gathered in Kassel in the, you know, in the framework of Documenta to occupy Documenta, but at the same time became also forms of a, a sort of exhibition in itself that was part of Documenta. And more obviously, it was in uh, the same year in the Berlin Biennial that Occupy, Wall Street, and Indignados were actually part of the exhibition. They have a space in the exhibition itself for gathering and processes, political processes and discussions. So this is interesting to see also what are the political agency and how much institutions, biennials and triennials are absorbing, occupying places of political action, or the other way around, how activist practices are occupying institutions and uh, places like biennials and triennials. This is a beautiful project by, uh, and also ironic in many ways, by Peter Sloterdijk and Hessa Muller, um, that is called the Pneumatic Parliament. It's not necessarily talking about cultural institutions, but I talk I use it to talk about them, because it's talking about more institutions of democracy in the Western world and how they imagine that they are brought into more remote areas, places like Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, many others that by the conception of the West are perceived as a lack of democratic processes. And obviously you imagine almost democracy or this parliament bringing democracy as something that could be dropped through a plane and just touches the ground and inflates and suddenly creates an atmosphere of democracy and all the citizens yeah, just welcome it uh, full of you know, happiness and, and so on. So this is in a way also what certain biennials and uh, temporary events are expecting that they will drop some content or some environments in the cities and then everyone will have to be extremely excited about it. But it's not necessarily the case. And um, well, and actually, it's, stories are more complicated. So I was talking about this Pompidou Mobile and this idea was to be a circus, like light as a circus, bringing this idea of a space that could occupy the cities and so on. But you think about it in this image that I, I love because brings the idea so well that in order for these institutions to um, you know, destroy or, or uh, give away their white walls and their protections, actually, that's not that easy. And you see that the image is the circus tent, very light and very, but it's surrounded by a fence, totally dependent on climate uh, control systems and security systems. So at the end, this, what I call these circulating borders, uh, where we think that the borders of the institution have fallen and have been, become more city, civil and citizen-oriented spaces, we see that borders multiply. So it's not that easy, uh, uh, the situation. Even inside, 
uh, you know, they could have decided to have uh, not originals, but copies of the artworks, but they got the originals, and that meant that they needed extra security. And even inside the circumstance, you see the replication of the white wall of the institution. So the white wall, the value that is assigned to the artwork, etc., continues uh, in this case. This is the case of Guggenheim Lab, also struggled uh, with this activist position. So there was a moment in which uh, certain communities from the Lower East Side protested uh, because they were saying that these type of institutions were bringing gentrification. And the day after, they were already embedded in the apparatus of the institutions because they were transforming an image and we like, were subject for a debate about occupation and activists within institutions. So sometimes it's very difficult even to um, challenge these institutions because they're very smart and well-trained to absorb certain discourses as well. Obviously, I'm not only critical. If I'm looking into these projects, it's because I found them fascinating as well. So when the Guggenheim Lab in New York left, uh, the former space that was an abandoned space became a community center, open-air center, to where many different activities are happening. Um, but it moved to Berlin, and in Berlin, again, encountered opposition. So actually, it was supposed to be in an area of the city, and because the protests of the uh, citizens, it never happened. And uh, it was discussed in Parliament. They found another location for the Guggenheim Lab, and it could only open uh, surrounded by this police barrier that were protecting the project. Um, and it stayed like that. This is also one of my favorite images. I show it a lot, but it's this uh, lady with the teacher saying, we don't need New York to teach us how to talk. So kind of protesting this idea of that global institution from New York comes to Berlin and talks about participatory practices, while Berlin has a long-standing tradition of participation and political action. And it has stayed like that for the entire uh, process of the Guggenheim Lab. So you see police have to be protecting the space uh, all the time. And this was the entrance of the complex where it was located, with uh, police also uh, parked all the time there. Not only that, in this case, the borders that I was showing in the case of the uh, Pompidou Mobile, where all these barriers and climate conditions. Here, the borders are even more sophisticated because Guggenheim, who is the support, was the supporter of the project, actually uh, facing you know, the problems of security in Berlin, uh, decided to support the police itself. So I found this in a BMW magazine, and it's like the headline was BMW gives 20 new BMW authority motorbikes to the Berlin police, and they were celebrated. So actually, um, Duggenheim uh, somehow, or BMW, was supporting the police in order to protect itself, its own brand, and its own project. So as you say, like, this complex spatial politics in the city around institutions that want to be more civic, oriented are, are actually something that interests me. So yeah, I was extremely critical, scholar, and doing my PhD, and suddenly I had the brilliant, uh, fascinating opportunity to become a curator for the Oslo Architecture Triennial that I'm super grateful. Uh, it gave me a completely different, uh, you know, uh, form of practice. Um, we were five people, extremely naive in many ways, and we did too many things, and we wanted to address these questions, uh, and some things went well, some things got, uh, well, went not that well. I mean, uh, in general, it was very, very good, and we enjoyed it, but we learned. So the idea was to think about belonging, uh, how to think about forms of identity construction, and what are the objects, the spaces, and territories for a new construction of residence ideas of how we live today when we live in transit, forced transit or desired transit. And um, we decided to address it in many different ways. So I want to explain quickly the different platforms and why we selected those, what were our mindset. So there was an exhibition that was called On Residence, and then we invited people who was working on redefinitions of the concept of residence at different scale from objects from you know belongings at the level of the object to forms of belonging at the level of the geopolitical thinking about borders and 
It was interesting. So it's, it was a mess of an exhibition because you didn't know when a project by a, someone started and the other started, which for us was beautiful because bl us blurring the authorship and blurring the lines between projects, creating new uh, readings. But for the artists themselves were outraged in many ways because they were like, you know, this one is interfering mine, I need like, um, and there was even an anecdote with one very famous artist who was invited to show work and uh, the galleries came saying, I cannot believe that you put her work in a met metal grid, like a yellow metal grid. This work has to be in a white wall. So either you put a white wall or we don't show the project. And we said, well, we are not gonna put a white wall. This exhibition is not about white walls. So she took away the project. Um, so, you know, these things are interesting, the politics of the exhibition space, the idea of authorship, and, you know, what it means to create all the readings between projects and what it means for the artists who actually are presenting their work. Uh, another platform we say, okay, we also want to do a call for projects, um, for interventions, not only more speculative projects, but applied research for six months. Uh, what we did, we select a series of locations around the world, also thinking like, this is the Oslo Triennale, but Oslo is not only the border of Oslo, Oslo or the questions that Oslo is facing are happening elsewhere. And we wanted to bring this, instead of this national, local focus, we wanted to also think through more than uh, across borders. So we selected different um, cases studies that we thought we're encompassing or uh, encapsulating very important notions connected to belonging, and we open them for an open uh, competition, an open call, and this, the selection of projects uh, were shown and interventions in another exhibition that's called In Residence. And some of them were a forum for Arctic, Arctic negotiation in connection to the Sami community around Kirkenes, or there was this uh, relation between forms of production and identity construction in Prato, around the Chinese factories in the Italian city, that Matilde Cassani did a beautiful project about solidarity, uh, changing the, you know, the symbolism of the um, images of the city itself, and the coats of arms and so on. There was certain projects that were uh, happening inside the uh, centers for asylum seekers in Oslo, in the garden, uh, forms of community engagement. And this was just an Apple Press. It's a very simple tool, but it was something that was creating uh, a lot of uh, engagement uh, across different nationalities and people in the Asylum Seekers Center while wa waiting to know about their status. And many other uh, also events and uh, et cetera. This was a project about Airbnb and this idea of that you can belong anywhere and it was beautifully treated by Ila Beka in this uh, documentary work or film. Uh, yesterday we were talking about tables and this is our attempt to create a table. Was, uh, this, the table was the Opera House in Oslo and we said, okay, we want to bring very different people and some people wouldn't come if we don't bring them to this big place. And so that was the forum of the space that we found um, that will, will bring different voices. Some of them, like the uh, CEO of IKEA, that he was discussing this design for shelter. And obviously there were people who were criticizing him, openly him on a stage. So we wanted to bring this friction between practitioners, CEOs of companies, activists, and uh, funny enough, this big architecture and iconic architecture served as a table in this case, a table for discussion. There was a book. Uh, we were very practical in selecting how to organize the book because the idea was we want these conversations around migration and belonging to be part of the curriculum of schools or be uh, portrayed in media. So we commissioned essays that were 1,200 so they can circulate online, another 3,000 words can become syllables of schools. So we also were practically oriented in what is the outcome and where we think is important to bring this conversation. And there were two more platforms. One was the Academy, that as, I've, as far as I know continues also in this edition, but this idea of bringing students from all over the world to discuss around the questions of, of the biennial. And there was some, Cristina Goberna with his students did this amazing, beautiful publication that you see students discussing, 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 and they even 
revolted, took over the academy, and uh, decided to you know, uh, do their thing after a, a week. And finally, and probably this, well, Lea, you, you has, have talked about it. It was a very, very moving project, um, very architectural as well by Jonas Stahl and the communities of Rojava, this um, New World Embassy uh, celebrating the stateless communities of the Rojava community. And what was important for us is this transcended the biennial. It was an occupation of the city hall of Oslo, this symbolic space, by this other architecture that was challenging the power inside that same space. And at some point, we disappeared as biennial, as curators, and was not our, we were not relevant in that space. What became relevant it was what was happening inside. Um, it was an official, the mayor uh, opened, it, opened the, the debate for two days. It was very symbolic because the communities of Rojava are part of a non-recognized state. So having an official, like a mayor, opening up, it was a form of like recognition of, of something and in Oslo. So it was quite a big thing. And if you can follow the conversation in Twitter, no one was mentioning the biennial, and I think I'm happy about it. Like, we don't have to be there. It was like Rojava representative uh, offices uh, to improve relations with European Union, or Rojava representative office open the Oslo, uh, in Oslo, uh, a, a new uh, uh, embassy, or Syrian Kurdish Rojava representative office open in Oslo. So it was more that was actually operating as a real political space of representation. It was not artwork anymore. And that's the potential that these biennials or exhibitions might have, that they have a very transformative potential that under the guise of an artistic intervention, you can actually intervene in a very political way, in a very political uh, environment. Um, how much time I have? Ah, okay. And, well, this was a big thing, and then I got a big thing also, uh, that was this, um, I was a curator of the Dutch Pavilion and the Venice Biennial in 2018. And I'm not Dutch, as you can uh, judge by my accent. And um, it was a thing, not to, like the, the curator of the Dutch Pavilion is not a Dutch person. And actually also I invited many people that were not considered Dutch. And it was uh, some uh, criticism before the pavilion opened that I had to face very harshly in uh, social media, especially by a person. And um, I had to give a lot of explanations. And, but I used it in a way also to challenge the idea of the nationalism associated with the Venice pavilion and these ideas of national uh, identity especially in a moment that we are seeing how problematic it is with the race of, uh, you know, stream right, etc. So what I tried to explain, I invited people like Beatrice Colomina, Mar Wigley, uh, and Amala Lag, Simon Nikhil, Liam Young, many, many people. I tried to explain, they might not be Dutch, or maybe there's, yeah, this, this one guy is Dutch. Dutch is considered by the standards, is white, is tall, has been uh, from Dutch family forever. This other person is Dutch, but is from a Somali origin. He came as a refugee to the Netherlands, has been living here and doing cultural production for decades. This other person is not Dutch, he's Iranian, but has been studying in uh, Tew Delft for more than 10 years, doing the PhD and now teaching. So it's not Dutch, but has been contributing to this, to this country. The, so I was trying to also open up what it means to be Dutch or not. And, and I was always thinking, what do you think about Dutch architecture? I mean, places or uh, studios like MBRDV or OMA wouldn't be working if it's not because they are supported by students and architects coming from all over the world. So let's talk about what it means to be Dutch. So that was the first attempt. Um, I think at the end people understood and, and was well received. The second is that I was talking about the Netherlands not being Dutch, which is also problematic. But I tried, this was my attempt. This for me is the Netherlands, it's an orange, greed um, that makes everything Cartesian. It's a way of domination of the environment that the Dutch did very well. They impose these lines over the territory. It's a very, very man-made territory, but it's also very equalizing, homogenizing, but it also has this democratic spirit of everyone is the same. Everyone has the same opportunities. 
It's also alienating. But what I was interested in is behind this apparently seemingly homogeneous grid, there was very weird stuff that <laughs> I wanted the people to see. And I always say the same anecdote that I went with my sister and m many other people that they, s they thought that that was it. That was the entire exhibition. And I was like, ah, let's go to the pavilion. And she was, uh, should we leave our stuff here? And then we go to the pavilion. I was like, no, <laughs> this is actually the pavilion. And she was like, oh, how nice. Was, uh, OK. <laughs> but it was beautiful to see how people were like, oh, OK, this might be open. And so there were different worlds happening, worlds and worlds and windows and doors. And behind these walls, there were rooms. This is Mark Wigley talk, talking about constant, talking about automation, and how violence was a seemingly liberatory project like constant in like New Babylon. A very Dutch, for like paradigm, paradigmatic Dutch um, project of architecture, utopian architecture. And I was questioning who actually was the automation and what type of bodies were supporting the utopia of playfulness on top. Um, I'm not going to stand, but we can talk later. This was Amal Allah to talking about the doors of no return and obviously talking about automation in relation to the um, history of slavery and the enslaved trade in which the Dutch were involved. Um, it was interesting to bring as well this conception and this idea of colonial mind mapping and architecture, how it participated in uh, actually the confinement of people and the use of these bodies as non-human bodies for increasing production and labor, forced labor. There was this idea that, well, some other people talk about that yesterday, talking about automation. So the transformation of the labor and also the landscape in the Netherlands through automation so this is, uh, you know, the Dutch landscape, the greenhouses, most of them automated. Beautiful and a scary image, by the way. How the typology of the farm has changed, has been taken over by these other uh, big corporations that are occupying big parts of the, uh, of the landscape. And then how different species coexist with machines in the countryside in the Netherlands and what it means, these relations between automated beings and living beings, like in this case, the cows, also have good time. <laughs> but also the questions about gender. That's why yesterday was some people told me, oh, you are so tough with white men. Yeah, but <laughs> I am. But even in, this is the no effort. So the manual of architecture, when it portrays uh, domestic labor, obviously portrays women doing the labor. So we have to conceive like how much in architecture we are have these biases as well. And this picture also came yesterday about the relation between automation and domestic labor. And we also talk about sex work in relation to domestic labor <laughs> and labor and feminine work, and especially in the Netherlands where you know, the sex work has been legalized and has particular architectures. And many people imagine that the red light district will be populated by robots soon. I was interested in these relations between humans, machines, and how they transform the notions of architecture and labor and leisure. This is Beatrice Colomina, the great Beatrice Colomina, talking about the uh, uh, performance so, uh, that, that did Jocon and John Lennon in a hotel in Amsterdam in 67, and how she uh, performed it and reenacted uh, during a day in pyjamas in the Dutch pavilion. Thinking about the bed as a site of labor, a contemporary site of labor for many people. And there were more like questions about representation, digital, etc. So in addition to this idea of identity, also the criticism around the notion of uh, progress in relation to um, automation in the Netherlands and how it is perceived, how it affects different bodies. There was also a comment on the space itself of the biennial. So uh, the, the Venice biennial is mostly a place of competition between countries. 
So we decided to join forces with our neighbors that in this case were the, the um, Belgium and the Dutch, the Belgium and the Dutch. We decided to do an open call to think about how the Giardini could become a place of collaboration instead of competition. And there was a winning proposal that was called Europa. Uh, so the day of the official opening of the biennial, the three pavilions, instead of having the names of Holanda, uh, Spain, and Belgium, they had Europa. And finally, this is an, uh, an exhibition that I brought because um, it's talking about, uh, I'm good? One minute. I'm not going to do it. You give me three minutes. Yeah. So this is architecture appropriation. This is on squatting. And this is a completely different uh, type of architect, uh, exhibition because it started with the exhibition. Instead of being the exhibition, the final outcome, we wanted to do something about the squatting to talk about uh, affordable housing and to challenge ideas about social housing, why it's not discussed anymore, questions of property. We take it for granted, and we thought that it was important to do that, but we use the exhibition space as a site of gathering and to meet people rather than just uh, representing a space. Um, so quickly, the history of the Netherlands is very much connected to squatting, so it was uh, tolerated until 2010. Uh, so if a building was empty for more than a year, people could actually occupy it. So we're thinking about its origins in relation to the movement of Provo, who were having this white uh, uh, house plan, like painting houses in white to sign that they could be occupied because they were empty. And also the fights that were happening around questions of uh, eviction and emptiness. The, how squatters participated in pre preventing uh, speculation and destruction of historical monuments and neighborhoods, how squatting opened the possibility of forms of community living beyond the family uh, structures, and the information points. So the, uh, the, the squatting in the Netherlands is quite institutionalized because there are like uh, meeting points and manuals where they explain you how to actually occupy the squatting action and so on. With these manuals, for instance, this one is by uh, 2016, it still circulate and happen. So this is the squatting ban uh, by which uh, a squatting became uh, illegal and obviously has to do with an increasing uh, form of development and real estate uh, market in Amsterdam and other cities in the Netherlands. So uh, just to point it out. This, on the one hand, is a map of empty houses or empty offices in, the, in Amsterdam. And on the other side, uh, collectives like the We Are Here, that is groups of asylum seekers that they don't have places to stay. And the difficulties, uh, you know, to see these two images together, on the one hand, the possibilities that the city offer, and then that the system doesn't allow for people who need a place to stay to actually occupy one. So we did this project, uh, which all its complexities that I don't have time to explain, but in a way, how to include squatting as part of the Dutch uh, archive of national, national archive of Dutch architecture, and give them then the same space as the OMA project, etc. And on the one hand, we call it architecture appropriation because also there is the risk of institutional appropriation, and the other, we thought that was important for an institution that receives so many millions a year to recognize other practices and voices that are fundamental for the transformation of the city, but are not recognized. And in this case, it's people who doesn't have the degree of architects, but are actually transforming it. So just quickly, we did a series of representations, forms of annotations, so the architectural drawing, more normative drawing, was embedded with other voices, other forms of understanding in space. Uh, there were beautiful moments in which, you know, the communities did their own archives, actually, in parallel. So it was not only one, the national one. There's, like, many other autonomous archives that have uh, populated. And three examples, Port Hebao, and three political uh, ways of acting, mezzanines. So... Uh, the squatters decided to uh, multiply the floor space in this space because if they are apt to be evicted, they will have the municipality will have to give them the same square meters that they have. 
So by multiplying it made almost impossible to give them a, because it's a huge space. So well done for them. Uh, so their space is full of mezzanines. Bravo, super interesting uh, strategy. This one it was ADM, one of the most interesting spaces in Amsterdam that was evicted despite many, many efforts. And it was more do it yourself. This is the pizza tower that his uh, owner did uh, as they need it. As the family grows, they just grow it. This is some form of support that we, as national institute, give to this space to uh, um, avoid eviction, but we were not uh, heard. This is an interesting space. It's an office building occupied by refugees. They transform the space of offices into housing. But in order to maintain themselves, they did a deal with the owner. And some of the spaces were transformed into office spaces who paid certain uh, rent. And with that money, is sustained. Sorry. One, one second. This is important. Why this is important? Because there are certain things that happen. And you could say this is very simplistic. But there was, this building was nominated for the Dutch Design Awards. And you could say it's not enough because still there's a squatting ban. But at the same time, there's a growing understanding of the importance of squatting as a form of architecture. And there is also good news because recently there was a judge who uh, ran, uh, ruled in favor of a group of squatters who were occupying a space. And actually, they allowed them to stay because they judged, they decided that the reason by why these people wanted to stay was more stronger than the owners. They didn't have clear plans for development of that space. So I think that's how certain architectural exhibitions could also act politically. And that's it. <laughs>